So um, first of all, I want a, a round of applause for um, Prashanth and Jean and John. So thank you again, guys. So we have the opportunity now to dig in just a little bit and, and kind of dive in, you know, 10 minutes or so is, is never enough, right? It goes really fast and you, you feel like, wow, there's all these things that I really wanted to get to. Um, so this is the opportunity for, for our, our speakers to dive in a little bit more deeply, but to be guided by you in terms of um, what you all really want to hear about. I, I, you know, I love the idea, Gene, if it's a, you know, what, what do they want, right? What do they want to know? So um, what I'm going to do is just sort of go down the line a little bit um, just to kind of get us going, and then we're going to turn to some audience questions. So um, Prashant, I, I, I wrote down a couple of things here. Um, one was, I, I love that you said that it, it's a, the faculty's responsibility for this, and that really struck me as a faculty member that, you know, this is not just something that you kind of like, dude, we have a responsibility. Um, and with that, that the next generation it will need this. They need it now, and they'll probably need it even more as, as we go forward. Um, and I think you did a great job of that in the talk. What I'd love to hear a little bit more about, and you just touched on it a little bit, were, was maybe a vignette of what mm -hmm. this actually looks like inside of one of your classrooms and a little bit of the nuts and bolts of that. Um. So as I said, um, when we try to instill um, these ideas of entrepreneurship among the students, we do it both through the courses and also through the co-curricular activities. Um, and what we noticed, well, in the true spirit of entrepreneurship, three years ago, this was supposed to be a curricular exercise. The goal was to simply set up a few courses and, and let the capstone then work its magic to allow students to practice and put these concepts into, uh, into play. Um, <clears throat> when, when I went out and talked to the industry members, they were less interested in the courses. I mean, they, because once you show them a list of these are the courses we want to um, equip our students with, they're like, okay, thumbs up, these, this is great. What's next? Um, how can we help? Um, and my first ask was going to be, well, do you want to come and teach some of these classes? Because that was uh, obviously interesting to us. But I, saw, I sensed an eagerness in them. So I said, well, would you be interested in sponsoring one or more of these projects? And they were said, yeah, maybe. Uh, what would it cost to sponsor a project? I had no clue. Um, so I said, um, I don't know, 10, 15K a project, and they, seem, they all nodded um, in agreement, and we felt we had a plan, and, and so that's wow. what we have. Um, this is the first year running. Uh, obviously, it took time, and we spent the most time with paperwork, not the projects, not the dollars, but the paperwork. Um, and we have seven projects um, this year. Um, we have five partners. One of them is an international partner. Um, wow the affordable prosthesis, um, Jaipur Foot, it's an organization in India. Um, and what we've noticed is we were not wrong in assuming what happens in the classroom can be extended very easily into practice. And when students saw that, they were excited to be in the classroom too, um, because some of the courses we were planning on teaching or currently teaching were not those that would be picked up by any individual discipline, right? So we wanted to teach a course on um, it was simply a one-unit course, so 10 contact hours um, on regulatory practices, right? Sure, every department has its own set of that, um, but when you talk about just medical devices, and if you're saying there's only going to be 10 contact hours, students are more excited to take it, especially if they know um, that they can be applied in a project. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. Thank you. It, it's always fun to hear those details, and you know, you're right, the paperwork, right? We all, we all experience that. It's like, oh, the paperwork is, feels crushing, but I think you know, as you've probably seen, once you go through it once, yes. you got it under control, and then it makes smooth the path for, for things in the future. Um, and I, I love that you mentioned the getting out there, mm -hmm. because Gene, that was actually my, my question. You know, what I sort of took away mm -hmm. was that, you know, really getting out there, and it's clear that you did that. I'm curious, are there some tricks, techniques, things that you can share with us of how you've actually done that in your classrooms, how you maybe get mm -hmm. your students engaged in that process? Well, we have, um, I teach some entrepreneurship classes and then we have uh, some engineering classes and when they get projects to develop a specification, part of the 
part of the assignment is to go out and talk to potential users. And so I use it in my class. We have other people using it in their classes. But th they go out and they ask questions, and hopefully they use the mom test where they're not talking about or trying to sell their product. They're really trying to understand what problems they're solving so that they can really create value. So it's, it's really just asking the student, telling the students it's part of the thing that they have to do is to get out of the building. And so I have an undergraduate entrepreneurship class where they have to come up with a product and they have to come up with a specification and they have to go out and um, right. talk to customers. So what, what do they struggle with, right? Because that, that's always an instructor. I'm always like, okay, well, there's certain things they're going to do great and it's going to be not a problem. But just in your experience, what are the things that they come back and go, oh, it didn't go so well? Well, what happens is if one of the and it happened to us, um, is, is that if you, if you don't stick to the script, basically, where you, you don't start talking about your product, then you fall into this thing where you start talking about it and they ask you a bunch of questions. So in our case, um, if, you know, we, we're not supposed to talk about our product until after we listen. And what happened was, is you have a doctor who starts saying, well, what happens, you know, when they know what you're working on, because they're not supposed to know you're working on blood. Students do the same thing. They start talking about their app or their software application. And... So with a doctor, what happened was, you know, so uh, you start telling them a little bit about how this is going to work. And then they, well, what happens in the blood? What happens in the kidney? How does this work there? And how long will it, it's like, and you don't know any of that. And that's the biggest downfall is when you think you're supposed to be just listening and then you start selling or talking about the product. That's, that's the biggest trap. Sure. And then the other part is making sure you're focused in on who you're supposed to talk to. Because if you don't talk to the right people, you don't learn what you need to talk sure. about. No, thank you for that, because I think anyone who's going to adopt this needs to know kind of where the sticking points can be. And you'll learn one way or the other. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, John, I, I was struck by a, a, a comment that, that you made, and that was, uh, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but innovation is not an elective, it's a requirement. But then I loved how a, a minute later you followed up with, it's, but it's not enough. And, and I think that, that that's just, I, I, I love that imagery. Um, for students, for faculty, um, and it's clear with this master's program that it's, it's working. It's doing what you intended it to do. Um, but if it's not an elective and it's something that should be required, are there some ways that you're either currently working on it or thinking about how you can bring this to, you know, I hesitate to say everyone, mm. um, but, but where this could actually intersect more than just your, your graduate program? Well, we've looked at um, how this might translate to the undergraduates, or, and, and I've recently looked at the kinds of things that are happening even at the high school level. Um, recently, I've, I have an inventory of 36 national programs that are aimed at entrepreneurship at the high school level. And so our students are coming in better prepared than for entrepreneurship than they have in the past. However, Having said that, I don't know if you've heard, maybe it's because of my age, that 70 is the new 50. Well, it turns out that 20, 25 is the new 15. Uh, the students are more knowledgeable, but they're incredibly immature. And they're connected, but they don't know how to talk to people. And so part of what we've instituted in our courses is a section on how to talk to people and how to get out and talk to people. So all of the things that we do at the master's level, I think is bo are both scalable and transferable. And we gladly will share with you any of the content of what we have. If you go to our website, all the material, course material is all there. It's open source. You're free to use it. And I often considered imitation the greatest form of flattery. So thanks, John. And, and I would actually extend it. Do you, do you have materials that you'd be willing to share? I don't want to completely put you on the spot, but we have some, some folks who are obviously interested in this, um, some things that you'd be willing to share with folks afterward. Um, so the mom test is a book, and the cover, what was, what was behind me. Um, and there's another book uh, that, that's suggested um, in different workshops called Talking to Humans. It's a, it's a really good book. So that's a resource. And then I'll be creating a card where the author of the mom test has sent me a number of classroom type tools that can be used as well. So uh, they'll be out there. They're just not there yet. I was a little preoccupied with this talk. <laughs> and yes, absolutely. Um, we've already started to imagine 
um, beyond just materials if we can share projects. Um, and then we spoke of this idea to the industry partners. They were excited because they were happy to imagine that a, pro a single project can be worked on two or maybe more campuses, which may lead to entirely different results. Um, and as one advisory board member put it, it was not necessarily the success of the project that was important, because that is, um, you can't predict what might be the outcome. But they were happy that the end outcome would be student training, and also knowing what would and what might not work. Mm -hmm. um, and may, perhaps what might not work is more important to them, because they wouldn't want to spend you know, $100,000 uh, a year on, on, some, an, on a direction that is probably not the right direction to take currently. Great. Well, thank you. We, we have some time, I believe. Uh, where's Michael? We have some time. So uh, we, this is our opportunity to break the fourth wall a little bit. And uh, we can get some questions from all of you. I believe that there's a microphone um, that will appear in your hand if you uh, signal yes. that you have Raise a question. Raise your hand and I will come. Wow. I, okay. There we go. Now I'll talk quieter. Tanya Nilsson, Santa Clara University. Question for Jean. In your example, where you're, the scenario where you explained mm -hmm. your impl implementation of the mom test, you implied basically you already had a product and you were out looking to create, see if there was value to it. Mm -hmm. When you're working with your students, are you also suggesting that they take a, something they've thought of and see if they can find a place where it exists, or are you doing? Because the mom test sounds a lot like human-centered design thinking, where you first have to identify mm -hmm. what is the actual problem by listening. Mm -hmm. So are you, when you send them out there, <laughs> have you only had them define what they think the problem is and then learn more about the problem? Or are they really going out with a solution first? Um, so we didn't have a complete product. We had a discovery. Uh, my colleague, who's in the audience here, um, had a discovery that we were talking about. So it wasn't a complete product yet. Um, and then we had to form hypotheses. When we send, and we were testing those as part of the grant, and, and that's when we had kind of the revelations. Um, so we never changed the product or, or the, the idea of what we were working on. With our students, we go through an exercise where they have to write uh, about their idea as a founder, as what the lean launch process uh, starts with, and they start with that, so they have an idea of what their product is and what we look at it from the standpoint of what the benefits that it delivers, and we actually go through the idea of what problems do you think you're going to solve, and then they form hypotheses, and then we also f have them form an idea of who their potential customers are, and then when they go out, they talk to those potential customers to prove their various hypotheses about what the problem they're trying to solve is. So they have an idea. Some have various ideas that they've been working on for a while. Some they make it up uh, as part of the assignment. So, but we do some exercises before we send them out there. Does, does that answer your question? Other questions? So I'm, I'm Curious, you know, this is just in the in the interest of going a little bit deeper into the what can go wrong. Um, and I know you already gave one example, but just for the the three panelists, um, what what have been those stumbling blocks? The things that have taken the most time, um, your time or the students' time, um, to to really overcome. Hmm. Well, let me just say for the we use a cohort model for our master's program. Twenty five students who are in a IP secure space, it's their space, they can configure it as they want. And of course, when they're together for 11 months, 24 hours a day, seven days a week developing their um, products and their company ideas, uh, I learned that as the director of the program, I also had to be vice principal. So uh, for those of you who know, the vice principals are the ones who handle the disciplinary problems. And I found in my, literally my second year of doing this, I was served with a court order for one of the students to stay away from another one of the students within 500 feet. <laughs> so I didn't anticipate those kinds of interpersonal problems. In, in hindsight, that's probably ignorance on my part. 
when you get people to work in a skunk works model where they're working that closely, we also have to spend time managing interpersonal relationships, particularly when the students are from various disciplines. They have different mindsets that all come together in support of each other. Yeah. Um, the, the students have the biggest problem with, with focusing on who they think their real customer is going to be because they're not trying to sell it, but they have to talk to somebody. And so we have them write a specification, essentially, of who that person they're gonna to talk to. So they'll say men and women. Well, it doesn't narrow it down very much. Um, companies, big and small, uh, <laughs> can, you, can, you narrow, can you focus it a little bit? Can you get it down to a NAICS code or something like that? Uh, number of employees. So we really get them to try to understand attributes because otherwise they're gonna be asking a lot of they're talking to the wrong people, and they waste a lot of time doing that. So before you send them out, the best thing to do is get them to really focus. You know, age, gender, experience, education, any kind of attribute that, that you can think of. And then they go and they test the hypothesis with that person or that prototype or archetype, as sometimes is used. Um, and then, uh, but that's the biggest problem is they know what their idea is. It's just got to get it to the right person. And then later on, they can figure out if there's enough of a business model to, to actually be successful. For, sure. uh, for our program, Biomation Design, um, it was timing. Um, you know, I, I remember after the first few conversations about with the industry partners on what we might be able to do as a, as a sponsored project, I, w I would show up, as, I guess, as an engineer with these Excel sheets of what needed to happen in what quarter so that we could get the project started in fall because if this was gonna be a capstone project, we need capstone projects to start and fall. Um, at least the idea, ideas mm -hmm. have to be out there and fall. And they would look at it and they say, this makes perfect sense, summer would be a good time, we could you know, discuss projects and all of that. And as you know, paperwork and other things take time. And one of our partners gave us the project in November and we didn't have any teams left um, because all the, all the student teams had um, picked up their projects. Um, Yet, you know, now the company was a partner. They had they'd put dollars on the table, and I was not going to reject the project because we didn't have students. So it forced me to develop, uh, establish other connections. So we looked outside and said, who else can solve this type, these types of problems? And that's how we built uh, a partnership with the um, College of Sciences and, and the business school. Uh, and I'm glad at some level that happened, right? Otherwise, I would not have been able to, A, make those connections, and B, stand in front of you here and say, we've built connections across campus. But now we've truly built a, uh, connections across campus. We have three projects, two of whom, uh, two of the projects are now being run by um, students in College of Sciences and one project in the marketing department in the business school. Mm -hmm. Great. Do we have any questions now from the audience? Ideas? All right. Well, you're 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 making me uh, making me work for it. Oh, we got one over there. Sorry, the the light is is right there with you. Hi, gr great job, everybody. Um, <coughs> I'm curious. You know, in my talk, I mentioned that almost all university incubators and most um, tech transfer programs um, fail. And in spite of the fact that folks like you, who obviously doing great work, what do you think the biggest problem is that we need to confront? to transform more of those programs into being productive ones? It depends on how you define productivity. If, this is my opinion, the role of a university is to create talent, not products. So if we say the products of a university are the students, then, well, it's a very productive approach, right? Because we will be equipping them with the skills to create value in the community. Um, so that's how we define productivity for bioinnovation design, and, that's, and the advisory board were very supportive of that mission. If the mission was going to be student-centered, they were all in. Um, and so they felt the KPI, so as to speak, for the um, lab should not be number of patents or number of you know, commercializable products or any of that, but rather number of students who went through the program, number of students who got jobs or who received internships or so on and so forth. Um, we don't have an incubator per se, but one of the things that we look at is um, we know our students are great problem solvers. They got great toolkits. Um, when they're coupled with the entrepreneurial mindset, 
we know that they're going to be able to create value. And when we start to see students when we start to see companies that are clamoring and fighting over our students because they know they're going uh, to have a great return on investment because they're going to be creating value within companies, we see students working through their senior projects and then are going to graduate school. Um, I, I, get, I get the graduate students who take their senior projects and they come into graduate school and then they're writing business plans around those things um, and they get real excited about those kind of things and then some launch companies, some license them, some patent so, and, and those kind of things. There's, there's real success that way, but I, I think it's, our job is really to create those problem solvers in every discipline, engineering, nursing, e everything, and then uh, business as well, and then um, have them with, go out with the, with the mindset that they can create value and they have some of those tools as well, and they know who to partner with and who to connect with, and they've, maybe they're not gonna start a company, but, or, or they're maybe not gonna lead a project right away, but soon in their careers, they will. And they're gonna be coming up with great solutions to problems. I think that's what we look forward to. Great. From my perspective, um, when you talk about tech transfers, and, and you should separate tech transfer from incubators, um, the tech transfer uh, phenomena, if you will, has grown out of legislation that basically says federally funded research must be or should be commercialized. And you have this, this whole, uh, I forget what they call it, um, translational research. And the, the grants have to have translational research component. And so we have Office of Tech Transfer that are focused on this graduate research commercialization. Um, and then you have, on the other hand, then you have incubators. And uh, one of my colleagues, Lisa Getzler, who runs our Baker Institute, for innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, and creativity, she did a survey of the incubators and in, the, in the country and found out that nine out of 10 occupants of those incubators are student startups. They're not coming from funded research. So I use the example of um, Google versus Facebook. We all know those stories. Google came out of a DOD uh, NIH funded research. You now it had a hard time getting through, even through their tech transfer. But then there's Facebook, and Facebook came out of a student's passion, or, or lack of ways Careful. to express his passion. <laughs> he needed a date. <laughs> and so you have, we have this huge untapped resource of students who have this, this uh, entrepreneurial spirit and no place to go because the tech transfer offices are focused on graduate research. To make matters worse, at about eight years ago when I was given the opportunity to start this program, I said, well, let's just give them an MBA because we have an entrepreneurship track in our MBA. We've had maybe 10 successful students since about 2000 who've launched businesses couldn't get into the MBA program because they didn't have three years of industry practice, which was their accreditations requirement. So here we have people who have launched business, who have sales, who couldn't get into an MBA. Again, so the th things have changed, but again, it's, it's the granularity of, of what is in your innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem that supports entrepreneurship at all levels, from students to researchers, faculty, and so on, is where your focus should be, and the tech transfer and the incubators are just one or two aspects of that. So I, I, I actually, and I, I think you have, you have a, I just a want comment. To quick, sure, go ahead. I just want to quickly follow up on that. One of the reasons that um, I believe we're attracted to the, the NSF i projects is because it does focus on value and problem solving and creating value and getting out and learning about that value and, and helping those move forward. We've, we've had uh, quite a bit of success with those projects, and um, we're quite proud, so I'll throw this in, is that um, our, our blood project actually resulted in a patent pending, and we have six undergraduates on our patent. So we're excited for them and for us. So it's, it's pretty cool. So I, you, you both touched on, actually all three of you have touched on this idea and the title of this 
whole section is EML for faculty, I believe. Um, so I'm curious, what are the other groups and partners that you've, that you've pulled in? Um, so there's obviously the students. I know we've heard a little bit about industry partners. Um, and you've all touched on faculty other than yourselves. Um, but what are some of the other groups and partners that you've, you've sort of pulled in to this mix? Um, we, uh, we have a, a group on our campus that's working on what we call the MSOE mindset. And it, uh, it's a group of people, uh, of, of fellows, who um, are working in every department. And so we have, we're cross pollinating in terms of I'll go into one of our software engineering classes and I'll talk about how to create a business model canvas and to do value propositions. Uh, I've gone into Dr. Zhang's and, and done customer discovery. And so we're, we're cross pollinating uh, across all the different silos. We, we've had quite a bit of few silos, um, but we're breaking those, those things down. And so we're, use, we're, we're working in one another's classes and bringing in design thinking. We have Stanford, uh, the, the, uh, the in University <coughs> Innovation Fellows who are uh, coming in and teaching. So we have students that are actually resources teaching design thinking um, after attending D school. We have faculty, we have cross faculty training. We, of course, we go into um, industry and we have close partnerships where uh, we have some professors actually working in the summer at some companies and doing uh, workshops and so I did some workshops at one and then one of our uh, software professors did another so it's everybody and anything that we can work on community partners and getting it all happening and anything to add? Um, so within campus beyond faculty and students we've tried to work with other program directors um, I like to say I'm inherently lazy by nature, so if somebody else can do the work I ha I, the program needs to do, then I am happy to delegate. So we've, we've formed partnerships with um, mainly the Frugal Innovation Lab and the Miller Center. Um, they both provide a great opportunity so, list. Just for the Miller Center. For social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurship. They provide a great uh, avenue for uh, s projects for nonprofits, but also offshore projects. We've um, for recently f uh, are beginning to form tie-ups with the CIE, which is the Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurship on campus, um, and then the various department chairs and department heads. I mean, uh, at some level, uh, they need to be not just. I wouldn't. I wouldn't look at this activity as seeking permission, but rather be informed um, just so that they understand the value the program can bring in, right? So I, I would like to see our program more as a horizontal and not a vertical, which can touch upon multiple departments. Um, I truly be believe healthcare is a complex problem and it, no one discipline should imagine that it's just their business to solve the problem, right? So, um, and so I, I think I've em you know, I embraced that uh, well, so I work with as many people as I can. So, so at my institution, uh, I think two or three come to mind. We have an entrepreneurship minor that is open to all undergraduates from any major. And that's um, how some of our students uh, start to develop their mindset and skill sets in that area. We have our Baker Institute for Entrepreneurship, which has various competitions and so on on, on campus for student entrepreneurs. Um, we have the, our capstone program um, is interdisciplinary with students from engineering, business, and arts uh, that form teams. Uh, this is our 27th year of doing it this way. We've had 230 students this last year and 31 teams with 25 sponsors. And that's going to be growing to additional majors going forward. And finally, we have the Keen program. And our Keen funding was to uh, infect half of the faculty, engineering faculty, and that's 75 student, uh, faculty. And 1,800 students are now being exposed to the mindset and skill set model leading to a portfolio and understanding the, the uh, innovation and entrepreneurship <coughs> ecosystem which they're working. So this model has grown across, uh, across campus, and that's all internal. Externally, we have our Ben Franklin uh, Partners Center, which is an incubator. We have, again, multiple acceler accelerators across the area, uh, Lehigh Valley area, and all of those, including small business development centers and so on, are all in as part of this ecosystem that we expect our students to get uh, involved in, to, to reach out for, and hopefully uh, use as they go forward. 
Great. Michael, how are we doing? We're good on time. So Great. So if, if there's no other questions, we can break. Come on, questions. Come on, keep us here. They probably don't have the yep. food out yet. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm having trouble speaking with allergies. I don't know if this is a good question, but uh, how do we handle, you alluded to it in your last comment, how do we handle the faculty who don't necessarily buy into this? What, what approach, what's the big proposition and approach? How do you suggest we do that? If I may, again, having just got half the faculty in the engineering college at Lehigh engaged, I um, use the four Fs. Um, it should be fulfilling, it should be fun, you should always have food, and you should have funding and, or some kind of recognition. And so, again, in, in recruiting faculty for doing that, I found those four Fs. Now, it's, I only was able to get half the faculty. The other half uh, weren't interested, and that's fine. It's the old lead follow or get out of the way uh, model pr works. I hope that helps. But Gene? I'm looking for some sort of an argument maybe for <laughs> those who are non-believers. Um, uh, one, one approach that has worked for us is to simply use so the students. J just a second, just to, to repeat that question, it was what, what's the argument to the non-believers if folks didn't hear? So the approach that has worked for us is to quote unquote, use the students, because if the students are interested in the project, and we know that project requires a special, a specific area of expertise, let's say um, VR, and there was only one or more faculty in the university who could use such an expertise, then the, stu then the students go and they approach the faculty and they get it done. Um, and students are great at that. Uh, they don't need, uh, you know, we, we talked about connection, uh, how connected they are. They have taken all the classes. They, they know why they're excited in a particular field because they probably have taken a class with that faculty member. And when they make that first connection um, to the faculty member, it eases any, if there was an obstacle that becomes easier to overcome because often the faculty's second, next question would be, um, okay, this seems to be a good prob a project, uh, but this may require X, Y, Z resources to be have funding for it. And I have an answer for that. Um, often it's, it's, if I went and told them, do you want to partner with Bioinnovation Design, they might say, not interested. They're interested in working on the project, but maybe not partnering with Bioinnovation Design, but that's secondary. The primary goal, again, is to train students, and students can go and find their own mentors. They're great at that. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's really an argument, but uh, what, what we, we expose as many faculty as we can to the mindset and we work with them, and as students start to talk about how cool of an experience it was and how they're engaged, and other faculty talk to other faculty, we're hoping it spreads faster than E. coli and room temperature chicken. <laughs> but the idea is that it spreads organically through the organization, and so you don't have to go in and compel them or any of those kind of things, and we're finding that as the word gets out, the students are talking to one another, Students are then talking to other faculty <laughs> members, and, and then the faculty members are talking to other people and saying, where'd you get that idea from? How'd you do that? And say, oh, did you sign up for the Keen, uh, you know, and, and uh, that kind of thing. So it's, it's more of an organic spread as opposed to, uh, you know, we're gonna, gonna make you do it. So um, it's, and we now have a great framework um, because of our, our Keen grant, if I can say that. Um, we, we have a framework, and we've, we've put it in there, and we've branded it internally as well. Um, so, and it's, it's built off of things we've been doing for a long time, and everybody goes, well, that, that's, that makes a lot of sense. And it's like, well, here's how you do it. <laughs> and next thing you know, they're infected. <laughs> if I may, just to give you an anecdotal, um, what we tried to do, we have, we have uh, 15 identifiable programs or majors. And the first year, I tried to get one faculty member in each of those areas to be part of what we're doing. And then the second year, second year, I asked each one of them to find two others. And then the year after that, two more. So, John, so, you're saying you're all about pyramid schemes. Exactly. We get a beach, We don't like we, to call them pyramid <laughs> schemes. You get, a, you get a beachhead, and then you grow fr from your peers. The, we had an interesting uh, meeting about a year ago with bringing in the last cohort of faculty. And the discussion was around the concept of 
It's not about my faculty teaching or research. It's about student learning. And that's a major thing to overcome, having spent six years getting promoted, another six years to, to tenure, where it's all about you and full professorship. But when you're able to make that flip, saying it's not about me and my research and my teaching, and I'm, I'm not going to evaluate my teaching basis based on students' feedback. What I'm actually going to do is look at what they're learning and how do I measure what the students are learning and what artifacts do I have? How do I know that they've, they have this concept? One of the things we have done for the doubters, the faculty members who aren't sure that they want to do this, is we have them teach capstone design. Capstone design, as you know, if, if you look at capstone, it's the top brick on a wall, and all the stones and so on are under it. And those are all the undergraduate courses that they supposedly have learned. So when they get to the capstone, they can apply what they've learned. And what I've discovered, having taught the capstone for almost 30 years, is that they know and have learned nothing. Nothing. They got A's and B's, but you ask them to do a free body diagram or a simple circuit diagram, and they look at you like deer in the headlight. They took the course, they got the grades, but what did they learn? What did they, re they retain? And so when you start the conversation of, we want to have the focus be on student learning and how do we know they're learning, all of these techniques that you heard from the speakers now come into play. And then this faculty, hopefully, the switch turns and said, are they learning? Sure. Okay. If there are, are there? More, no more questions, that is the, uh, the session. Well, let, let's thank our speakers again.